Tony Doman. And I'm Renee Rogers, and we both work here at the Birthplace of Country Music Museum. And today we're going to tell you a little bit about genre. I don't know if you've ever heard of genre, but basically what that means is different artistic, literary, or musical compositions that are sort of characterized by style, format, or content. So for instance, there's different types of literature and books from murder mysteries, to science fiction, to memoirs and biography, to poetry. And there's different types of art, um, abstract expressionism or impressionism, landscapes or portraits, and of course, there are different types of music from country to hip hop to bluegrass, pop. Um, what's another one, Tony? Oh, there's so many. I know. Oh my gosh. Um, there's even disco. Disco, yeah. <laughs> disco, techno too. Yeah. So all the different things. And those are like different categories of genre. And it's just a way to sort of classify those broader categories of art, literature, and music. But with the record industry, marketers actually began to target audiences and market to them in order to get them to sell records. And so back in the early days of recording music, record producers looked for and aimed to find music that fit into those specific genres in order to sell their records. And one of the things that we focus on here in the museum is the term hillbilly music. So hillbilly music just means early commercial country music. The types of music that you would hear in hillbilly records might include traditional, string band, or old time music, and they were primarily marketed towards white rural audiences. And within the hillbilly genre of music, there's actually different types of songs, and this might include traditional, sacred, gospel, traditional ballads, instrumental, and more. So like Tony mentioned, the hillbilly songs were marketed to a white rural audience. And that segregation or separation of genre was quite common at this time, not just in country music, but across the music industry as a whole. So for instance, at the 1927 and 1928 Bristol Sessions, you had two African American acts who performed here. In 1927, we had a solo act with Elle Watson, and in 1928, Tartar and Gay performed as a duo. Um, both of them, as African American acts, actually played songs that weren't super dissimilar from the music that was being played by the white musicians, but they were marketed differently. So all of the songs by the white musicians were marketed as hillbilly tunes, while the um, songs from L. Watson and from Tartar and Gay were marketed as race records, which was the word back then for music made by and for African American audiences. So despite the fact that you see this segregation or this separation of genre, and you still see it today, you know, we still talk about someone's a pop singer or someone's a country singer, um, that didn't mean that audiences weren't listening to both kinds of music. They were look, they, they, it didn't stop people from saying that they wanted to hear music from all of these different genres, and that's true today too. So for most of us, we listen to a whole host of different types of songs and different artists based on what we like and not just because they belong to one genre. And that will, that's what was really interesting back in the 1920s, that despite this marketing and despite this sort of push to make money in this way, these artists were also influencing each other. There was different genres that were, that were growing up out of this in later years and people, like I said, were listening across genre. So let's talk about the term hillbilly. The term hillbilly has been used to describe rural southern mountain people, including Appalachians. Sometimes throughout history, it's actually been kind of viewed in a negative way. And this could include people thinking that term might come across as backwards in your way of thought or your way of life. And it's also been used as kind of a slur and has been pretty derogatory in the past. Uh, on the contrary, hillbillies can also be seen and observed as a, being a pioneering spirit and living off the land and being really self-sufficient people who are passionate about family life. In the 1920s, the term race records was coined as sales boomed, and record producer Ralph Peer saw this and started designating those records as country music or hillbilly records. So supposedly this also stems from a story back in 1925 when Ralph Peer was recording a group and one of the members in the group was trying to figure out the name. What are they gonna call themselves? And so one of the members of the group said, you can call us anything you want. We're just a bunch of hillbillies from North Carolina and Virginia. And so that term stuck. And then uh, the industry started using the term hillbilly. Ralph Pierce started using it, record producers. And the term hillbilly music has stuck ever since and it still continues to this day.